On behalf of Emmanuel College at the University of Toronto, I welcome you all to the inaugural conference of the Applied Buddhist, of the Applied Buddhist Studies Initiative. I'm Henry Xu, an adjunct professor at Emmanuel College and also the chair of the conference committee. Let me explain briefly about the background of our conference today. With the generous gift from the Buddhist Youth Alliance, Alliance International, Emmanuel College has established the Shi Buddha Professorship in Chinese Buddhist Studies to launch the new Buddhist stream in the Master of Pastoral Studies, the MPS program, which is the first of its kind in Canada. This program prepares, to, uh, prepares graduates to be certified with the Canadian Association for Spiritual Care and qualified to work as chaplains in hospitals, educational institutions, senior homes, prisons, and other public institutions. In collaboration with the Buddhist Education Foundation of Canada, Emmanuel College is launching an Applied Buddhist Studies Initiative. The ABSI will complement the MPS program at Emmanuel by offering Buddhist, uh, by offering additional by offering additional educational programming in Buddhist chaplaincy, which hosts events, events to advance interdisciplinary scholarship through workshops, conferences, and publications, which is what we are offering throughout this weekend. We hope that the ABSI will provide an array of opportunities for engagement by the Buddhist community and other academic disciplines and also for the students in the NPS program to be exposed to a richer understanding of con contemporary issues related to all the traditions of Buddhism as well as other faiths, helping them make practical use of their education in the future careers. This has been the first year Emmanuel College offers this new Buddhist, Buddhism stream in the NPS program. And we have here Professor Trey Nan Yu, who is the, uh, the, the Shi Buddha professor of this program. Earlier, the college has also created a Muslim studies program with all, our, uh, with all of our faculty members and students dedicated to connecting theology to our multicultural environment. Emmanuel College seeks to develop a scholarly platform for interreligious engagement. While respecting academic freedom and social and cultural diversity, the college encourages its students to explore the history and practices associated with their own religious understandings. In the same way, Emmanuel College engages the study of Buddhism, adopting the pedagogy of integrating both the theoretical, theoretical and the practical, as well as integrating scholarship with practice and service. We offer students the opportunities to uh, for self-reflection and to progress in the Buddhist path of wisdom and compassion. Students are encouraged to learn from the diverse manifestations of the Buddha's teachings expressed in the traditions, as well as applying them to understand the causes of sufferings in the world and to find appropriate skillful means to alleviate them. The training of Buddhist chaplains and the courses on Buddhist ethics and Buddhist contemplative care are some of the examples of such skillful means that we are offering. The program, of course, is still in its formative stage. We hope to learn more from all of you to build towards a better program. We also hope that this conference, through its various panels on Buddhist chaplaincy in Canada, future directions for the integration of Buddhist psychology and psychotherapy, Buddhist education, Buddhist chaplaincy, sorry, Buddhist priest and chaplaincy, humanistic Buddhism, as well as the globalization of Buddhism, all of these will be a forum for the exchange of ideas and practices among academics, researchers, professionals, community leaders, and graduate students interested in the study and also involved in the actual application of applied Buddhism. Special thanks goes to Professor Krensky, who kindly agreed not only to be our keynote speaker and lead a workshop on the theme of sustainable compassion training, but also help us finalizing the theme of this inaugural conference. We look forward to your keynote speech this evening. Thank you.
Okay, thank you, Henry. Uh, my name is Dr. Kenneth Bung, and I am with the Department of Psychiatry. I'm an associate professor with the Equity, Gender, and Populations at the Department of Psychiatry at the University of Toronto. I'm also the clinical director of the Asian Initiative in Mental Health. Uh, and I'm, the, uh, I'm honored and delighted to be the moderator for this first session. Um, just so that you know where you are, the first session is on the future directions for the integration of Buddhist psychology and psychotherapy. So if you're in the wrong session, the hits in is over there. <laughs> so this topic is near and dear to my heart, and we have here uh, esteemed uh, panelists who will be making presentations. So how we are going to work the panel discussion is that each panelist will be up here and make a presentation of 20 minutes duration, and we're going to be timing them exactly. And since uh, we abide by the therapy hour, therapy clock, it will be pretty precise. I think Henry was already giving the subtle hint as he was advancing, advancing the slides that uh, <laughs> things have to move on yes. quickly. It was almost halfway through Tony's presentation. <laughs> so at the end of each 20 minute presentation, we'll have about five minutes for questions from the audience, and we want this to be highly participatory. And when the three uh, panelists have finishing their presentation and uh, Q&A, we have a larger uh, period of time for uh, free open discussion. Okay? So without further ado, I'll introduce you to our first speaker, Dr. Tony Toniato. Dr. Toniato is the Director of Buddhism, Psychology and Mental Health Undergraduate Program at the University of Toronto, devoted to the study of Buddhist and Western psychology. He's also on faculty of the Buddhist Mindfulness Mental Health Diploma Program and the Masters of Pastoral Studies in Buddhism Program at Emmanuel College, cross-appointed to the Human Development and Applied Psychology Program at OISE, or Ontario Institute of Studies in Education. Dr. Toniato is a registered clinical psychologist and psychoanalyst. He received his PhD in clinical psychology from McGill University and has spent 23 years at Cambridge Center for Addiction and Mental Health in Toronto as a research scientist in addiction. Yeah. Dr. Tignano <coughs> has published over 100 peer-reviewed articles and book chapters in the area of substance and behavioral addictions, comma, especially pathological gambling, comma, and mindfulness meditation. I said it that way in case you get confused when I was reading it. He was studying the addiction to mindfulness meditation, which kind of <laughs> weird, but without further ado, Dr. Tony Adam. Thank you, Dr. Wong, and I'm very afraid to go past my time a lot. At the same time, I feel I don't want to be rebellious and kind of go past my minutes. I like I feel that kind of response too, but I won't. I'll be a good boy and finish definitely on time. Um, and this is one of my favorite topics to talk about, so I can easily talk about this really the rest of the day. Um, I, I'm, I'm a psychologist uh, and a psychoanalyst, so uh, I do psychotherapy and, um, and work with clinical populations. I'm also a Buddhist uh, of the uh, Vajrayana or Tantric uh, school of uh, Buddhism. And it's always been a struggle how those two fit together, if they don't fit together, and how, how so. And I've always kept them quite separate. And I still do, and I probably always will. But I think there is a lot of interest in, in our culture uh, and, and at the uh, professional level of how possibly uh, Buddhist, Buddhism, Buddhist psychology might influence um, uh, psychotherapy and, and other health disciplines. And that's what I want to talk about today in a very, very uh, restricted way and very short way. But hopefully um, we'll give you something to think about. You know, in, in the uh, Catholic tradition and the Mahayana tradition, we have an image of the Buddha as healer, medicine Buddha. And he's a healer of uh, medical or physical disorder, but also the mind. I mean, he really is a, a divine psychologist, if you want to say, a divine physician. And so there's that intuition that, that, that uh, among uh, the, the vast Dharma, a lot, of, a lot of it has to do with healing, suffering, of course. Uh, and as a psychologist, I, I think I love this, this. There's many, many depictions of this particular image. And I always love to, to gaze at it. I find very, very healing to do, to, to do so. Probably all of you know that the most well known aspect of Buddhism that has had a huge impact on mental health practice in the West is mindfulness meditation. I really cannot 
um, go on the internet or uh, go into a bookstore and not find literature on this topic. In the past 20 years, thousands of studies have, have been done evaluating this, uh, this modality. As all the way from enhancing well-being to reducing uh, uh, negative emotions to improving quality of life, reducing disability, and, 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 and pretty well every possible disorder you can imagine. The, uh, I, well, 10 years ago I used to try to collect the articles uh, as they were coming out, and I could pretty well, they were coming out about once a week, I could photocopy, I could download once a week. Uh, and then once a day was, was challenging. Now about 5, 10 articles per day, and I've given up trying to, to read them all, but there are really thousands of articles now. And now, throughout our culture, in the, in the healthcare systems, the education systems, even at the University of Toronto, um, one can access mindfulness-based programs and a variety of mindfulness, uh, mindfulness um, interventions throughout. It's become pervasive, it's uh, spreading everywhere, uh, and, it's, and, it's, and it's increasing daily. You know, you look at me, I know you had a preview of these a few minutes ago, so uh, now you have context. Um, <laughs> Every major newspaper and article will have articles on this nowadays. And, you know, I could have made a whole talk just showing you these kinds of images. Um, tremendous interest in, in, in Buddhism and in, in kind of the, let's say, the contemplative uh, psychotherapies, uh, the science of meditation, and the, every aspect of it. Mindfulness, why it's here to stay, the ultimate guide to lifelong calm. Um, psychotherapy network or mindfulness goes viral. What would Buddha say? You know, that's actually there's a lot in that. In that question, there's a kind of intuition that is this something that is Buddhist, even though the word itself seems um, comes from from, from uh, Buddhism when translated in a certain way. Uh, there's a, uh, a magazine called Mindful, which devotes itself to a variety of articles about mindfulness, so it's really quite everywhere. But mindfulness is only the tip of the iceberg, really just the smallest tip of the iceberg of what Buddhism can contribute to mental health and well and mental health and well-being. Although practiced throughout the world by hundreds of millions of people uh, as a religion, uh, Buddhism can also have a psychological aspect to it, a philosophical way of life and a form of psychotherapy. People come to it from different ways. They, what, what, what they want from Buddhism may not always be uh, it from a religious point of view, uh, especially people who are not raised in a British, you know, in a religious uh, culture, but are come to it through other means. In its essence, at least from my perspective, Buddhism stresses self-knowledge ethical behavior and self-discipline as a means to achieving wisdom, happiness, and optimal mental, optimal mental health. And I'm going to unpack this just a bit in, a, in one particular context in a few minutes. Uh, Buddhism is not only concerned with how we can see suffering, which is a role of psychiatry, for example, a lot of clinical psychology and medicine in general, but also how to maximize states of authentic happiness, not just um, transient happiness, transient satisfaction. How to maximize states of uh, happiness, equanimity, compassion, love, relationship, health, and facilitates and facilitates states of transcendence and the newness, contact with, uh, say, uh, a different level of, of, of psychic reality and religious reality. Thus, we can see that Buddhism can probably be seen as a profound spiritual, put that in brackets because that's not really a, an official term, spiritual psychotherapy. The goal of which is to catalyze or, or, or trigger profound transformation of the personality. Somebody who practices Buddhism should be a different person than they were before they started practicing Buddhism. Uh, it should be measurable, as Dr. Fung was mentioned. We should see the behavior and action in action in decisions and so on. The goal of Buddhism, maybe briefly put, is to maximize your human potential. And that is vast. Uh, not just the potential of this ego that you think you are sitting in this chair. It's just, just one aspect of who you are. But in a much more broader sense, um, if I had time to speak about it, to be the best you can, to become who you are. These are like almost cliches nowadays, people will talk this way. Western psychology, Western psychiatry generally ignores this aspect of human experience, mainly because they're concerned with alleviating human suffering, so that's not their goal. And has very, very little to say about human potential, and focuses more on, on, on uh, its, its uh, more, more restricted callings. We can't turn to traditional psychology and psychiatry for what Buddhism might contribute to, to psychotherapy. In the context of, of some dissatisfaction with traditional psychiatry and psychology, clinical psychology, Buddhist psychology can be consider, considered a non-Western, even non-medical, but not even non-reductionistic approach to mental health. 
that integrates a spiritual perspective, which in my, in my case, is spiritual, I'm talking about a connection to meaning and transpersonal values. In this context, voice psychotherapy is a kind of spiritual psychotherapy. So I'm going to get to the, the meat of my talk by bringing your attention to the Four Noble Truths. And I'm assuming everybody here knows what that is, so I'm not going to tell you too much about uh, where, where the Four Noble Truths come. Uh, these are the first teachings that the Buddha is said to have shared with his uh, followers uh, following his enlightenment. And they encapsulate, and they're called the Four Noble Truths, really to indicate Four Noble Insights, or like something that's, you know, um, uh, almost a uh, truism, which encapsulated his analysis of mental illness, the first two Noble Truths, and of mental health, the second two Noble Truths. But understood within a modern psychotherapeutic context, the first two Noble Truths describe a state of the individual who is suffering emotionally and who is seeking relief. In the Buddhist perspective, that includes everybody. Everybody would have been captured in this. In our, in our context, it may include our patients and people who are going through various stresses and trials in their life and various turmoil. And the last two noble truths describe the Buddha's advice on how to alleviate, even eliminate, suffering and attain genuine mental health. So noble truth number one, what uh, uh, presented, there is suffering. Not that life is suffering and there is only suffering, but that there is suffering. None of us can escape stress, stress unhappiness, loss, suffering, pain, frustration, trauma, adversity, and so on. As the Buddha often reminded us, aging, illness, and death are intrinsic aspects of the human condition. All of us are getting older by the second, all of us will die, and all of us will get sick. And Noble Truth 1, the first one, undermines denial. When you really <coughs> meditate on it, it undermines denial or one point to think about it, and forces us to face the existential truth of these, of, of, that there is suffering. Not just us, but all around us. Even if we're not suffering right at this moment, just on the street, or all the hospitals here are filled with people who are dying today, who are suffering, and, and so on. And of course, the animal world is just suffering pretty well. All our patients, all my patients, experience this kind of suffering that the Buddha describes in this truth. So this is pretty self-evident. No one is surprised by this. This seems quite, quite obvious. But the Buddha goes on to say something much very profound in his second old truth. He says that the conditions or causes of mental suffering lie within the mind. Suffering is caused by craving. And by craving, the Buddha doesn't mean craving as an, an addiction to craving, although it could include that too. The, the, the notion of the, the, the meaning of the word craving refers to these two aspects that I have listed here. Our inherent tendency to project our hopes and fears, our desires and aversions on the outside world, looking for happiness outside the mind to people, places, money, things, achievement, career, and so on. And that we think that will do it for us. That is it's a projection. Idealization, indeed. And also refers to the cognitive processes that obscure our understanding of what we experience. We get confused. And it fuels very destructive cycles of thought patterns, called Papancha Vitarka, that generate ceaseless suffering. And it's the focus of most modern psychotherapy. When I'm speaking to my patients, I'm talking about this part here, how their minds are working with what they're experiencing and the distortions and the beliefs and the illusions and, and the illusion that they are plagued by. It produces incredible suffering. And psychotherapy works with that aspect of the mind. <coughs> so the essence of the Buddha's analysis of emotional suffering is highly psychological and psychotherapeutic. He describes the pervasiveness of psychic pain in all of its forms and how our minds can create such subjective agony. This is the Buddha as psychologist or psychiatrist. The Buddha's analysis thus far is very compatible with modern psychotherapy in many ways. Buddhism and psychotherapy also share a deep optimism. So, in the way they just said, but they also share a deep optimism about the potential for humans to attain lasting happiness. And this is expressed in the third double truth. But there is a solution. And something sees when we have insight to our mind's function. We no longer distort, project, or idealize experiences. We realize the contribution that our minds make to our happiness and make steps to correct it. The Buddha believed that carried to its final step, this is a state of nirvana. All patients hope to maximize their attainment of genuine happiness, even if the patient falls short from nirvana. What time we have? You've spent 11 minutes and 32 seconds. <laughs> So another 15 minutes, I guess. Okay. The compatibility 
and comparability between the Buddhist and psychotherapy analysis of human suffering continues. So, so far we've got understanding suffering and saying that it has a strong psychological basis and that there is a way to, to come out of that and to, to reach happiness into the fourth old truth, which is his specific, very often practical advice on how to overcome suffering, the fourth old truth. But here we see specific contributions that Buddhism can make to enhance modern approaches to psychotherapy. This is where we see uh, um, elements of Buddhism that can enhance what we do in, in the West when properly integrated with the Western approaches or modern approaches. So the noble fourth truth number four states the way to end suffering is through the Eightfold Path. This truth states that only a comprehensive transformation of the personality at every level of our being can yield durable, authentic happiness. <coughs> Not just one thing or working just with meditation or just with one or just thoughts or just behaviors or just um, attention. Uh, you, can, you can't split up the human, the human being into, into compartments that way. That real, real lasting change come, comes from uh, a deeper change that take care of, that addresses the entire um, uh, being. And this is accord with, with some modern psychotherapies, not all psychotherapies. Not all psychotherapies would agree with, with the word of this, but my, in my, I, I am a psychoanalyst as well, and, and I would definitely agree that a true lasting happiness can only come, only come from a, a more um, a deeper understanding of, uh, of change at the personality level. And the Buddhist path stresses the cultivation of ethics, wisdom, and meditation as the three pillars of the authentic happiness. Here it is depicted just in a, in a schema. The first two, the orange, our right uh, is our the wisdom pillar. The next three, right speech, right action, right livelihood, is the ethics pillar, and uh, right effort, right concentration, right mindfulness is the med med meditative pillar, meditation pillar. And although we're in a circle, meaning that there's many, many ways to enter, um, there is uh, there's reason to argue that right view is a place to start for most people. But but one can one can really enter from a different perspective. It is it is a circle. So I'm going, to, I'm going to look at these eight very briefly, 40 seconds each, to make sure that adds up to the right amount of time. Um, from the point of view as a kind of a wisdom, each one being a type of wisdom, and I'm going to convert it into psychobabble, psychological, psychological language. So the right view I, I, is, is, when that's transformed, it produces perceptual wisdom. And that's the hardest, perceptual wisdom, to see things, to see things differently. Understanding cause and effect, karma. Understanding that all experience is transient, impermanent, and conditioned, empty, or a process. Understanding the nature of suffering, the cause of suffering, and the solution to suffering. These are very hard to do, but if not, then suffering can easily return if we don't understand the nature of our minds and we don't really see it from a purely experienced way rather than just. Um, Intellectual way. My students can easily write a, 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 a correct, can answer a question on this on the exam, it doesn't mean they actually see it. So, understanding and, and, and experience are different. Right thought, when that is mastered, transformed, it leads to cognitive wisdom, treating ourselves and others with kindness, compassion, and empathy, free of hate and envy, to be careful not to let our senses desire to harm us. The transformation of speech is interpersonal wisdom, all speech is interpersonal. This is about path of ethics. Monitoring our speech and thought go together to avoid causing harm to self and other through gossip, hateful, divisive speech. And I think it includes imagery as well. The internal speech that, that we, we imagine things. It's all part of the same speech. When we transform our action, we develop behavioral wisdom. Not intentionally hurting others by lying, violence, stealing, sexu sexually, or losing control of our behavior. See, it's not, a good, not, not enough just to act behavior-wise. You have to, the rest are all important too. What you think, what you see, what you speak. Right livelihood is societal wisdom, earning a living ethically with minimal damage to other beings in the world. And the last pillar, the path of meditation, right effort, really should be called labeled right emotion. This path is about emotional wisdom, coping with negative emotions. And I've caught, converted the five that the Buddha talks about into Psycho language, anxiety, idealizing, projection, depression, and decision to avoid harming self and other. Mindfulness, which is a kind of metacognitive wisdom relating to our mental life without confusion, aversion, or clinging. 
and concentration, which is attentional wisdom, cultivating inner stillness, calm, clarity, mental clarity, and focus. So the Eightfold Path emphasizes the attainment of mental calm, clarity, and focus, the path of meditation. Why? To perceive clearly the nature of mental experience, the path of wisdom, which naturally leads to the recognition of our interconnectedness with the whole world around us, people, animals, the world, the path of ethics. Mental health, not possible without a healthy relationship between oneself and the world we live in. Emotional health is both intrasubjective, I have to care about my own emotions, how we view ourselves, and intersubjective, how we view others. While modern psychotherapies integrate various aspects of the Eightfold Path, they do not generally address the entire personality, so it's impossible to argue the exception of psychoanalysis. The emphasis placed by the Buddha on emptiness, ethics, intersubjectivity, wisdom, valid cognition, compassion, transcendental values, meditation, equanimity, and so on, is absent from traditional psychotherapy and represents unique contributions of Buddhism. One might expect that Buddhist psychotherapy, a synthesis of Buddhism, spiritual values, and modern psychotherapy, may serve as a uniquely Western flowering of the arrival of the Dharma in the West. The treasures of the Dharma still remain to be properly and still integrated within a comprehensive mo model of human happiness and flourishing, where there are reasons for optimism, and optimism as we see a recontextualization of mindfulness practices, the emergence of positive psychology, and the and understanding of the biopsychosocial no, nature of mental health. And, um, and that was my last slide. <laughs> <laughs> I was looking at Dr. and saying, I'm having more. And uh, so I will stop there. Psychotherapy, 
um, for example, ethics. And I was curious <clears throat> if your engagement with the Buddhist tradition has perhaps uh, unconsciously affected how you do psychotherapy. Um, from a Buddhist perspective, uh, when we suffer, there's a huge uh, developmental point of accepting responsibility that we have often. We have a deep role in that, although you may say being a codependent, destructive relationship, and the other person's clearly doing wrong. Yes, yes. Still, there's yes. an understanding, there's this real profound need to understand yourself, and is that entering yeah. into yourself? I, I think that's true. You know, I, I wish I could do that experiment. Two Tonys, one never knowing Buddhism, one knowing Buddhism the way I do, and how, whether that would have care. My guess thing is that you're right, that unconsciously or you know, without, like implicitly, uh, it, it's done that. I think even my, my interest in psychoanalysis, which I only began about a decade ago, might have been that, as a kind of a secular way of, of integrating a more holistic view of the personality. And to take that a step further, wouldn't there be a benefit to be more uh, proactive, more conscious about um, you know, thinking about how could the basic Buddhist principles be used yeah. to actually be a little more self-aware about them. Yeah, and I think that's, you know, that's one of the things that, I think that we are endeavoring to do even with the master's program is to bring it explicitly into, into various counseling um, um, contexts. I know that a lot of students at the undergraduate level are drawn to that and they also want to explore that. There's no formal way yet, but you're right, that kind of interest I think is an example of what you said with uh, people learning about meditation and the minds and wanting to more, and then finding a career path that might bring it together in that way. So I think the next generation will, will be will be expecting something a little more um, integrative than they recently had in the past. Yes. Rachel. Or the, or the next one. Or the next one. I hope it's fine. I don't have to go through a lifetime of that. Good. Um, but you mentioned that you've worked, like you've worked with addiction and the whole idea of no, second noble truth being yeah. craving. Yeah. Uh, one of the biggest challenges right now is again the lack of integration or kind of picking and choosing what you like about it as right. opposed to taking true. the whole or the stop. And so. so true. How, how, how could someone approach that, like that's within the education system, not necessarily the educator, but like to see that integration or want, wants to approach it? Just yeah. Hard one to answer. That's a little discussion question rather than an answer. Yeah. Um, I think it starts with um, a, a, ther a therapist and a, an assistant that's very educated because, you know, you're right, there is a picking and choosing of ideas and techniques. You see a lot of the mindfulness uh, literature now, exactly. which I find really just intolerable, but, <laughs> and, 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 but it's very common and it's actually going to undermine mindfulness in the long term. Yeah, finding so, a research review is like a nightmare. <laughs> like, yeah, yeah. Yeah. And the fact, the reason it's partly because people who are doing the mindfulness studies and teaching it don't know anything about their minds. They don't really they understand uh, themselves well enough. That's one thing about psychoanalysis. I had been psychoanalysis. And that's one thing that most of the therapies don't want to ask you to, that you get to know your own mind before you start endeavoring in somebody else's mind. Yeah. Uh, and, uh, and, something, and that's true with like, Buddhist psychotherapy. A Buddhist psychotherapy, you just can't practice that and not practice Buddhism, you just can't <laughs> deliver it. But a lot of therapies are like that. You can be a CBT therapist, a cognitive therapist, and not really practice it. You can be addicted and do addiction therapy, uh, and so on and so forth. So it requires um, a kind of mindset of a practitioner who has mastered the understands their themselves through meditation and through studying the literature and the sutras and all that so they can actually then make that integration almost effortless or fluid rather than contrived or piecemeal. And that, that requires a special individual to do that. And did you say there was a master's program? Yeah, there is. Oh, okay, here? Um, yes, see? Potential student. <laughs> um, speak to me afterwards, make sure I'll tell you who to speak to. This is the front row. The front row to my left. Perhaps I would ask yes. you just uh, another so, question. Uh, well, well, question. Yeah. So maybe two questions. That we've been talking about integration of Buddhist concepts into psychotherapy. And certainly one of the criticisms is that you're very superficial. Yes. I guess the question is how deep do you go? Mm -hmm. Right. Because you can you know, go through the principles. And then there are also people who are trying to be very literal about it. Yes. Let's say trying to map a neurosis where, well, that's the realm of the hungry ghost. 
right. and, and trying to map the different realms to psychopathology. Yeah. What, are, what are your thoughts about you know, Victor Key of when that, do you stop? And that's true. One additional question is then, depending on the, I guess, the depth of it, to what degree do we then start to take that into consideration doing informed consent and say, yeah. if you are doing psychotherapy with me, you get Buddhism, you know, 10%. No, you get Buddhism like all the way. Because yes. there's no turning back. <laughs> so I'm going to transform your personality. <laughs> you have no choice. <laughs> so what are your thoughts about You know, cognitive therapy, which uh, Chapman mentioned, is virtually Buddhist psychotherapy. If, if you look at it deeply, it's working with um, the, the schemas, the, the cognitive distortions, the, the, uh, the misinterpretations of experiences in a similar, very similar way that the Buddha describes throughout the sutras. Um, so one doesn't even need to translate some of these. There are concepts though that I would be very careful ever bringing to a patient with a lot of knowledge, for example, emptiness. I would never use the word empty with a patient. That, you know, and a lot of patients can understand, would, would misunderstand that. So I use a word like, um, we are um, conditioned. You know, we are um, a conditioned process. We come together, and we, we, and we, our bodies change all the time, and you know, our minds change all the time, and it's hard to find anything. In fact, emptiness is what allows us to change, because if we like that we have, that we are conditioned that way, then we can actually shift, knowing that, rather than thinking that we are, in essence, something. All that can be done without ever mentioning Buddhism, emptiness, you know, uh, you know, uh, uh, any, any Sanskrit word or Pali word, ever, but get that same idea. So. When I think of Buddhist psychotherapy, I don't necessarily mean carrying over the jargon, more carrying over the, the essence of what the Buddha is talking about. As if the Buddha was alive today, living in Toronto, he wouldn't use Sanskrit words. He'd be using different words. Well, what words would he use today if he was living here? So we have to, we can't just, you know, take them, and like you said, bring them over and just do it. People in the West are, are different in terms of their psychologies and what they expect. But there is, but that, that truth though, cuts across geography and in time, and that's the challenge, I think, in integration. Very good. Thank you. Let's give him a minute. Okay, do you want to come change your slides? Get it ready? Oh, you know slides, you can them. So then let me just introduce our next speaker, Dr. Lynette Montiero. She's... Don't read it all. You'll, you'll use up my time. That's true. <laughs> Her brief bio is like five pages long. I am empty. So I'll just read you the highlights. She's a registered psychologist in private practice. Her master's in psychology from Carleton University explores the role of brain lateralization in human communication disorders. And her PhD research explores the impact on medical interventions on attention and impulsivity. Um, in preschool children with ADD, Attention Deficit Disorder. And uh, she's an expert in CBT, and, uh, as well as Buddhist psychology, and she likes the alignment of how the, those two come together. And with the advent of MBCT, she has uh, melded her own personal practice of meditation and CBT to conduct it in psychotherapy, as well as establishing the amazing Ottawa Mindfulness Clinic in 2003. So without further ado, let's give it over to Dr. Matilda.
the traditional definitions of mindfulness and contemporary mindfulness and how that, the dynamic in that, the dynamic tension in that is actually reflected in our own personal practice in terms of a, a, a dynamism between uh, the two, what Bhikkhu Bodhi calls the two faces of Buddhism. So I'd like to open this talk with a quote from Bhikkhu Bodhi. Um, and you can find this one, it is called, that it's in his essay on the two faces of Dhamma as uh, accessible on access to insight. When we try to determine our own relationship with the Dhamma, eventually we find ourselves challenged to make sense out of its two seemingly ir irreconcilable uh, faces. The empiricist face turned to the world, telling us to investigate and verify things for ourselves, and the religious face turned to the beyond, advising us to dispel our doubts and place trust in the teacher and the teachings. One way we can resolve this dilemma is by accepting only one face for Bhagavad as authentic and rejecting the other as spurious or superfluous. Thus, with traditional Buddhist pietism, we can embrace the religious side of faith and devotion, but shy off from the hard-headed worldview and the task of critical inquiry. Or, with modern Buddhist apologetics, we can extol the Dhamma's empiricism and resemblance to science. And I love that he says it's the resemblance to science, as we know it, but stumble embarrassingly over the religious side. Yet reflection on what a genuine Buddhist spirituality truly requires makes it clear that both faces of the Dhamma are equally authentic and that both must be taken into account. If we fail to do so, not only do we risk adopting a lopsided view of the teachings, but our own involvement with the Dhamma is likely to be hampered by partiality and conflicting attitudes. I don't think I need to talk anymore after I friend you. I'll summarize it at all, right? But uh, I've got a few minutes here. So Bhikkhu Bodhi, as usual, you know, uh, summarizes what's been for me a personal, and I suspect a collective, uh, for all of us, a collective experience of trying to reconcile our spiritual practice with our professional, re empirical practice. As many of us have been trained in the Western, philosophical modes of, of teaching and thinking. <coughs> By the time I heard about mindfulness-based stress reduction, um, and, and I do want to, to emphasize that, to, to reiterate that, um, I originally trained as, cognitive, as a cognitive therapist, and of course when I discovered MECT, I really felt like I died in Rama Nirvana, although you don't want to die in Rama Nirvana, but that's a different story. So by the time I heard about MBSR, and John Cabot said, I was really entrenched in my conviction that CBT was in fact the Dharma operating in 20th century guise. And this MBSR thing uh, was a peculiar Western distortion of the Buddha Dharma. I was able to resist MBSR as it became more, more viable and more visible in, in the psychological community. But when MBCT came along, I really felt that something important had happened in the psychotherapy and psychological community. For me, this was the first viable offspring between several Buddhist lineages and Western psychological lineages. In a sense, it was the Buddha Dharma meaning Herbert Benson's work in meditation and Arnold Lazarus's work in multimodal therapy and definitely Beck's work in cognitive therapy. At that time, too, my Buddhist practice had taken on the study of Sila and in Thich Nhat Hanh's community, I began to practice ethics as it is how he formed it as the five mindfulness trainings. Now, seen through this lens, I felt that the, the therapies labeled <coughs> mindfulness based, and I used to call it mindfulness based anything, um, missed something crucial. I began to question the validity of having something based in mindfulness, which is why it starts with it says mindfulness based, but something that was based in mindfulness that didn't appreciate its cornerstone, which is the cultivation of the noble person. So that bhavana piece is really important, and I find that it's sliding away from us as we continue to develop these mindfulness-based interventions. So with my partner, I worked on a program, or we worked on a program that taught mindfulness, more or less directly from the suttas, and emphasized, and this was a real sticking point, emphasized the conscious practice of sila. Coming from a cognitive behavioral perspective, you know, we practice the behaviors until they become embodied, and so that really fit for us. 
Now, when we began teaching, here's the intersection of this Western and Eastern lineage of these teachings. When we began teaching our eight, our eight week program in 2003, almost none of our patients had heard about mindfulness. And the reception, of course, in the medical community um, and psychological community was extreme aversion and a lot of derision. We got a lot of notes coming back from our mail outs that said, don't, don't send me this junk, which was, <coughs> which was interesting. When we started, also, we were so paranoid about people thinking that we were going to initiate them into a cult, that we weren't actually talking to people of what it was that we were teaching. So you can appreciate the irony, you know, here we were trying to teach the four foundations of mindfulness, the you know, Sadi Patana, Anapana Sadi Sutta, the five precepts, the five mindfulness trainings, but we're trying really hard not to use the B word, or the D word, or the S word. You know? <laughs> Now this is what can even the Brown brilliantly calls code switching. In other words, we're taking a Buddhist concept, giving it a non-Buddhist name, a language, and inadvertently obscuring the roots. But as mindfulness gained traction and its popularity increased, we noticed that something, and then we kept teaching, we noticed that something was not quite right with what people were saying back to us. They could speak about suffering, they caught on to the word, but it wasn't accompanied with an openness to investigate suffering. They could quote Tara Brack and Jack Cornfield and Sharon Salzberg and you know, even John Cabot Sin. But I would really cringe when they were quoting I told it, but that's okay. That's not what you take it. <laughs> but ultimately there was no motivation to go beyond the quotes and to really turn towards their suffering. Because that's ultimately the practice is can I turn towards my experience? Can I understand it? And then can I transform it? In fact, in individual sessions, and I was speaking to someone at, uh, before we got here about uh, what is psychotherapy that supposedly I do, um, I would encounter shock from my patient when I pointed out that, you know, you came in here asking to do Buddhist psychotherapy. Um, and I'm still, you know, um, undecided as, if, as to whether there is such a thing. But, they would say, I want to do Buddhist psychotherapy, and so I point out, well, you know, Buddha says, you know, Buddha, he teaches only one thing, which is suffering, and how we create and thought, action, and speech. And the response was, oh, no, no, I don't suffer. No, I don't suffer. That's for other people. You know, I just want to be happy. <laughs> and so I just want to be peaceful and calm like the Buddha was. I thought, well, you know, it's a great job if you can get it. Um, but I would point out, well, Buddha's calm was a result of becoming steady in the face of the impermanence of joy and sorrow. Right? It's, it's just the bigger being steady in the, in the face of the impermanence of peace and turmoil. And they would look at me like very puzzled, and you know, really, this is not what I've been reading in the books. And I said, well, okay, practice, let's practice then. So practice as it's 24 7. If you're going to work with me, you must practice 24 7. Even when you're sleeping, you have to sleep mindfully. And they still look at me very strangely. And I said, because we're always practicing something. Whether you like it or not, you're always practicing something. So you may as well be practicing something that allows you to cultivate those positive qualities that you're craving. And they usually look at me, and usually this is about where they stop coming to therapy. Um, does it say, you know, well, I sit, I mean, I, I sit for long hours, and then tomorrow I don't sit for long hours, but okay. So they said, I sit for long hours. I become calm, but it's really fleeting, so I must be doing something wrong in my meditation. I think this is the conundrum, right? Um, because along with the intention to achieve calm states comes a privileged language. You know, we've, taught, we've taught the community inadvertently to have this language that doesn't quite mean what it means in reality, in the Buddhist, in the Buddhist psychology. So I figured it out. Accepting is code for bypassing the experience. I'm just going to accept that I'm depressed. Okay? Letting go is code for I'm going to avoid pain. Just let it go. Okay? Just let it go. Right? Being one with is code for not causing any trouble by disagreeing or dealing with conflict. If I could just be one with the situation with my spouse, I'd be happy. I just need you to teach me how to be one with this. Mindful is code for, I want to be in this moment as long as it's pleasant. <laughs> <laughs> and I'm just not on 
Not everyone fell into these traps. There were people that I've worked with and I continue to work with who were really from the comfort ground practitioners and they're really rich in that. But many were seeking validation for their own understanding of what Buddhism should be and how it should service their needs. Now, you know, that's okay. Most people come into psychotherapy at that stage. My concern, though, is that they don't have a language to keep them at that stage. But, you know, the, for everything that's lost is something that's gained. The shift from traditional Buddhism to Buddhist modernism, from Buddhist practice to secular or clinical practice, is more than just a matter of languaging. Sure, we may have lost something in the languaging, but sh and we have to be careful, because shifts in language mirror shifts in conceptual understanding. Shifts in conceptual understanding, in turn, signal shifts of what are held as important core concepts. So in speaking about this shift, John McCowan, who's written some brilliant books, notes that the focus on the empirical research emphasizes the individual inner experience rather than the interdependent or relational experience. And in mindfulness, this is a real misdirection taken by the research. And this has an impact on what he calls the ethical space of mindfulness, which is relational. <coughs> in Buddhism, the scholar Robert Schaff notes that with the secularization and accessibility of Buddhism by monastics like Lady Seattle and Lady Mahashi Seattle, something crucial got left behind. Schaff points out that what got left behind was the discrimination of the moral valence of the phenomena as they arise. In other words, ethics, discernment at the level of moral action. My concern is that we're training people for short run hauls in the human experience at the expense of the long haul of the transcendental. The shift to secular mindfulness as its top reflects a loss of the meta intention, as MTA, the meta intention of the Dharma as a twofold path. First, as a means of clarifying comprehension of experience. And second, this is really crucial, is the growth of wisdom ethics with a trajectory to applying those ethics for the greater good. The inclusion of ethics in the MBI is a crucial point, and one that has resulted in a significant pushback in the Western mindfulness community. We examine this in our paper, Traditional and Contemporary Mindfulness. But in the 13 years I've been addressing this issue, um, the only response from the community has been that it's unethical, and this is really tricky, it's unethical to include ethics in a curriculum of mindfulness-based intervention. <laughs> <coughs> so John Kevinson states very strongly that we cannot impose our personal ethics on others. And besides that, so no big switch, besides that, ethics was already implicit in the MBSI. No. It's hard to prove that something's implicitly included, but I think if we look at it, it probably is. So my response to all of that is, if it's already implicit, what's the problem with making it explicit? You know, it's like giving me a really rich dish, but not but refusing to give me, give me the recipe and the secret ingredient. It's just totally unfair. <laughs> Secondly, we also we already impose an ethical framework when we engage as clinicians. It's already there. We have rules of confidentiality. We have guidelines of association. If you're leaving a group, you know what the rules are. You know, there's no association outside the group. You can't have sex with each other, in or out of the group. You can't come to the group, you know, under any influence of drugs or alcohol. You can't, buy, you can't violate physical or emotional boundaries. These are all ethical frameworks that we already apply to groups that we run. So separating away our ethics doesn't make the treatment ethically neutral. It also presumes that the participants don't bring those ethics to the group already. I just got a warning over this, so I'm going to skip down a little bit. <laughs> but I want to be fair here to point out that the concerns about ethical practice, about the explicit practice of ethics in an MBI, does have its validity if we are in fact imposing proscriptive morality or right? telling people not to do something. But ultimately, the issue is not about ethic, or implicit versus explicit ethics, but how can we be transparent about our actions in the service of others? Now, mindfulness has had some tremendous positive impacts as well, so we've gained a lot. It's become a tool for the masses, yes, and that's kind of ironic to the intent of the secularization of Buddhism, too. 
Um, but the greatest shift has come in the relational domain of healthcare. In healthcare, particularly in psychotherapy, it challenges the hierarchy of relationships between the therapist as a privileged person with insight and the patient as a recipient. In fact, mindfulness challenges our role as a therapist completely in terms of taking the role of letting the participant lead as we follow. Now, in the medical model, this is revolutionary because in the medical model of treatment, there's privileged knowledge. And in a sense, what we've done now is moved towards independent co arising and away from codependent arising. So the question now is how do we do this? How can I meet my patients without constantly having to engage in a game of that spot the fake Buddha quote? But does it matter? Maybe my patients are bringing a new lens to this, and maybe I can learn from this. And my colleague Jane Thompson wrote that often people take up Buddhist practice, so like some people who take up physical training. Some choose walking, some run 5Ks, and some run marathons. But they all end up healthy. And that might be something to hold within our head. The other part is the practitioners. And what I'd like to do is to engage in what David White calls a disciplined daily conversation with myself. And one way I'd like to hold, I'd hold this conversation is to ask this question. Who am I becoming in this process of clinging to rigid consistency and purity? But just very simply, who am I becoming in this moment? And very quickly, I just want to read this, my favorite story of all in philosophy, although I'm not much of a philosophy uh, nerd. The French philosopher René Girard, in his book, Things Hidden Since the Foundation of the World, tells the story of two hungry monkeys with a banana between them. At first, the competition is about the banana. Who's going to have the banana? Um, and that's because they're hungry. Then it becomes about becoming the one who has the banana. It's no longer about relieving hunger, but it's now about ownership. So every time I get caught in this dynamic tension in, in you know, contemporary to traditional Buddhism, language, things like that, I, I recognize that this could be for me an issue of ownership. And ownership has power over the other person, not the ownership of power over the person. And probably that's the most crucial question that I can offer you is that what might happen if I let go of trying to be the one with the power? Thank you. So 
we had respectful life, generosity, um, respectful limits, uh, mindful, mindful compassion, which is mindful action, and sorry, mindful consumption. And we ask people, we don't tell them this is what we want you to do in practice, that's so conceptual. We ask people to come up with things in their life or times in their life today, right now, that with, there's something incongruent in that, in that theme. So if you're not taking care of yourself, and you're, you know, you're burning out, which theme does this fit under and what behavior can you choose that will shift this a little bit? We're not that much gigantic shift. Can okay, you just go to bed at 9 o'clock one night? Go to bed at 10, get to the gym twice a week. It sounds really simplistic, but as people start to recognize that there is this clinging to this need to overachieve or to be driven, they start to see the change of behavior shifts up. So now they're making better decisions. They're making more moral decisions for themselves. They're taking on, so they're looking at an at at uh, incongruity in their values, in their value systems. Over the last year, we've run, uh, we've been collecting data in our groups um, measuring um, incongruity in spiritual values with um, um, <coughs> related to mindfulness after taking an eight-week program. So it'll be interesting to see if some of this is actually coming out. But uh, you know, when you look at it through the lens that we are already doing our very best to be the best people we can be and we fail, can we learn from that failure? Um, Thich Nhat Hanh talks about uh, the, the precepts as a North Star. I think that's what really, the intent is not to live on the North Star. The intent is to use it to navigate the murky waters that we're in. So I think when we look at it that way, this ethics issue is really not a big issue. Yeah. Thank you. I had something at the hospital called Mindfulness 101, mm -hmm. and we basically teach mindfulness skills to healthcare practitioners to maintain, you know, to resilience and practice. And when I was looking at how doctors and nurses are training, they learn everything, they learn history, the etymology, etc. So when we designed our course, we treated it as history. And what I found was when we got to the ethical part, to the precepts, and I also used to take the ones, five wonderful precepts, there was this kind of aha moment. Because what I find is that people know about that they don't realize ethics comes from spiritual traditions. And when they could sort of tie the two together, all of a sudden you can kind of see the metaphysical connections between the things. So I think it's an important area, in an area where people are really struggling to kind of understand why things work. It's, it's incredibly crucial because particularly when we don't know, if we don't know what our core values are, we don't know the, the, the map of our moral landscape, when we have to make really tough decisions that are in the gray area of ethics, like end of life decisions, yeah. like refusing treatment, things like that, we're lost. Yeah. It becomes this gigantic violation <coughs> as opposed to looking at the moral map and saying, what was the best decision I could have made at the moment? Yeah, absolutely. Um, the other thing that, that Ajahn Amaro, uh, in his response to our audience, has a brilliant, brilliant article, and he says, you know, it's, it's all well and good to say that, you know, we should be very careful about bringing Buddhist ethics into schools and things like that, but what we're not saying is that we already live with the subtle influence of Judeo-Christian ethics. There's nothing wrong with that, but we need to be aware of it. It's kind of like our implicit bias, we need to be aware of it. How I might be, you know, leaning towards that or being guided by the uh, unknown to myself. Thank you. I have a question. No, go ahead. I have a question with regard to the fifth precept. Mm -hmm. uh, sometimes we meet people of the young generations and uh, they may say, oh, just taking one or two drinks may not uh, be breaking the precept. Do you have anything to say? Uh, the precept on, on intoxication? Yes. Well, it depends on the context, really. I mean, I look at it in terms of their intention. You know, as you, it, the, the precept is really, again, it's, it's, it's formed as a prescriptive thing. But if we dig deeper into the Dhamma, uh, you know, you see that really the issue is, what was your intention in this? And what's the fruit of it? That's something we keep forgetting. You know, what are the consequences of this? You know, the Buddha, there's a wonderful sutra where the Buddha talks about um, how to give generously. 
and you give, you, you know that you're giving to someone of virtue by the virtue of their, of their of the outcome of your gift. And, um, and I think that's the same pattern of the same template that we use when we look at, you know, what was your intention in taking one or two drinks? And what's the outcome? What are the consequences? And is that really an act of generosity to yourself? Uh, is that really uh, an act of flourishing? Does it help you flourish uh, based on, on the consequences? We also have to, to account for the maturity level of that frontal lobe, which you know, doesn't mature until you're 26 anyway. Uh, but that doesn't mean you've learned any things um, by the time you're 26. As I tell my daughter, your brain matured at 26, but you know, now you've got to spend 26 years learning all the right things. Because <laughs> now you're ready for it. So we have to account for the maturity level of, of whatever generation we're talking to, whatever age we're talking to. Okay, wonderful. Thank you. So let's give her a big hand. share what you have commented on that a lot of Shep is trying to use mindfulness as a trick to avoid suffering which counters mm -hmm. what, uh, what Buddhism is all about as we heard. And acceptance and commitment therapy is another therapy that's very in line with what you're talking about in terms of turning towards suffering and acting based on congruent values. Now this brings us to the last speaker, last but not least, Ms. Clara Hull. She's an Ontario graduate scholar completing her MSW at the Factor Interwash Faculty of Social Work, or FIFS SW. FIFS. There's no acronym for that, it's too long. At the University of Toronto. She's won numerous academic awards for scholarship and writing in the topics of grief and bereavement. And she's co authoring currently a paper on group based expressive writing program to facilitate psychosocial well being for caregivers of palliative patients. Her research and clinical interests include end-of-life care, palliative care, the grief process across the lifespan. As the vice chair of the faculty, the factor into Walsh faculty of social work, <laughs> faculty council, <coughs> and the president of the MSW Graduate Students Association, she worked closely with students, staff, and faculty to improve the quality of social work education within classrooms and in the field. So let's give a big hand to Ms. Clara.
deal with death and loss. And I think Buddhist perspectives can provide great value to the field of grief counseling and offer alternative approaches to helping individuals process death. So I'm going to talk about death, grief, and loss through a Buddhist lens and compare it with what a Western, our current Western model of death, grief, and loss looks like. And then I'll propose how we can transform Buddhist understandings of death and loss into practical approaches in grief counseling and bereavement support. In traditional Western understandings of grief, many clinicians and even the general public viewed as a predictable trajectory through distinct stages of bereavement. So for example, in one hypothesized theory of grief by Dr. Selby Jacobs, who is a psychiatrist, the normal responses to grief move from numbness and disbelief, separation anxiety, depression mourning, and recovery. For Dr. Elizabeth Kubler-Ross, who is also a psychiatrist, it was denial, anger, bargaining, depression, and acceptance. These stages have prescribed timings, so such as completing a stage within six months following the death of a loved one. From these models arises the assumption that a deviation from the normal sequence of bereavement means something's wrong, and possibly indicative of a pathological grief response. I think when you couple this with Western views of death as the termination of life and a death-denying culture, which is actually quite prevalent in our society, there's a psychologically negative attitude towards the idea of death and a kind of avoidance when it even comes to grief. Grief is viewed as an experience that must be efficiently overcome in order to resume normal functioning. I think the medicalization of grief, where it's treated as a state from which one should recover, creates stigma, shame, and maybe even embarrassment for the bereaved. Grief counseling then offers social support and helping the bereaved reframe the meaning of the loss experience. It also involves encouraging someone to express, disclose, and work through their emotions. This concept of doing grief work, which is introduced by Freud in the early 20th century, is generally accepted to be part of the healthy process of adjustment, and failure to do so is considered maladaptive. However, these conceptions of death and loss and approaches to grief counseling are under question by researchers and clinicians alike. Some state that stage theories and the grief work hypothesis fail to recognize the variability that exists in response to death and loss. Perhaps normal bereavement for some involve a non-expression of grief or never going through a denial phase. As well, a large body of research also shows that formal interventions for the bereaved, like grief counseling, may not be very effective and even cause harm in some cases. In contrast, Buddhist models of death, grief, and loss challenge Western views that normal bereavement happens in predictable timely stages, and that doing grief work is the way to efficiently adjust to a new normal. It also challenges the death-denying culture so prevalent in Western society. So from the Buddhist perspective of death and loss, life is viewed as an endless cycle of birth, death, and rebirth. Death isn't seen as a termination of life, but an important part of the process of life. And I think that this perspective allows for normalization of death and for the space to confront it with greater acceptance. Buddhism not only views life as a process, but sees it in a process-oriented manner. So in other words, the Buddhist concepts of impermanence means that all things are in a constant state of change. This too shall pass is a commonly known phrase that illustrates a Buddhist attitude towards the existence of all phenomena, whether positive or negative, in our eyes. Another important concept is interdependent origination. Because everything is in a state of change, arising from something else in a very interconnected way, nothing exists on its own as an independent entity. Everything is nothing more than a set of relations and cannot exist without something supporting its existence. When those conditions and components of a phenomenon cease to exist, so will the phenomenon itself. Buddhism would say there's an emptiness to everything, because all things lack a stable and inherent existence. This idea also extends to the Buddhist sense of self. There's no I that is separate from other things. 
On the other hand, in Western psychology, the self is seen as stable and consistent, whereas in Buddhism, the self is impermanent and always changing. Suffering is then caused by an attachment to the idea of things and people as permanent. We suffer when what we've attached ourselves to is no longer there. Buddhism then sees grief as a consequence of how we habitually perceive our world as consistent and stable. We feel deep pain and loss because something that once existed no longer exists, and we have difficulty reconciling this. Grief is a profound experience in life's impermanence. And in Buddhism, seen as a spiritual opportunity to gain wisdom on the nature of existence. As grief is impermanent in nature, it is viewed as a process where emotions rise and fall, and there's no expect set expectation of how a person should experience their grief. The Buddhist view of death, grief, and loss focuses on process, presentness, impermanence, and change. How can we apply these ways of thinking towards a clinical practice of grief counseling? We can apply the understanding of death as part of a circular process of life and emphasize how suffering from sickness, old age, and death is a universal aspect of the human experience, which is also known as the first noble truth. From this, we can help the bereaved cultivate an attitude of radical acceptance, which is a mindful awareness of the impermanent nature of our experiences, whether they're painful or pleasurable. For many, I think it's radical because it's an attitude shift where no experiences are suppressed or turned away. They're confronted as they rise and fall, mindfully witnessed and observed. By recognizing that the suffering and grief is transitory, this may give strength to the bereaved to endure the pain and loss because this too shall pass. We don't have to attach onto it, we don't have to fight it or avoid it. As mentioned before, Buddhism believes in grief as an opportunity for the emotional and spiritual growth and transformation. And I think being able to accept that our feelings are always changing, and that it's okay to feel what you feel, rather than criticize our negative emotions. And I think that's a transformative kind of understanding. In Buddhism, I think a process-oriented view of grief, which involves learning to ride the ebbs and flows of emotions, thoughts, and feelings, rather than turning them away, can help the bereaved reconstruct a sense of meaning in their life. Being more attuned to the process of grief activates a being mode of living versus a doing mode of living. And this is emphasized in mindfulness practice. This kind of practice focuses on paying attention to our pattern of thoughts and feelings in the present moment without judgment. Doing this helps to cultivate a healthy distance from being in the thick of our heavy emotions. This mental space helps us to make sense of what our experiences mean to us. I think this approach can be applied in grief counseling as awareness meditation. This involves observing our moment-to-moment -moment flow of thoughts and emotions while consistently paying attention to our breath. This can help ground the intense and sometimes overwhelming feelings and thoughts that come from grief and help the bereaved achieve a sense of stability in their mind and body. Through being grounded in the present moment, the bereaved can slowly observe, embrace, and make meaning of their internal and external experiences. It's about gaining a sense of perspective on the loss and its impact on oneself. It reminds me of the Buddhist saying that when the water is very wavy on the surface, it's really hard to see what is within it. And only when the water is still and calm we can look into its depths. One of the big emotional challenges with grief is the sense of isolation and disconnection with others that someone who has had a loved one die can feel. And this can really deepen the negative emotions of loss and mislead those grieving to self-pity. Self-centered thoughts such as, my pain is greater than everyone else, or no one understands the suffering that I'm going through, can take over a bereaved individual's mind. People with these thoughts can lose perspective of the universal loss and suffering that everyone experiences. They can also fall into self-criticism and self-blame for not having done enough for the deceased. It can also fuel a sense of guilt, and for the bereaved may ruminate through negative emotions and refuse help because they just simply don't feel they deserve it. The Buddhist teaching of self-compassion can be a powerful way to help
help their grief to be more loving, kind, and forgiving towards themselves, and in turn be more compassionate towards their experience of grief. Self-compassion involves being kind to yourself, even when you're suffering or feeling inadequate. It promotes a sense of shared humanity and recognition that we all experience pain and failure, and that these are unavoidable aspects of the shared human experience. Self-compassion also encourages a more balanced awareness of our emotions, so we can honestly face our painful thoughts and emotions without exaggeration or pity. The use of visualization can help the bereaved foster a sense of self-compassion. So what I mean by this is meditating on different types of compassion imagery. So one can involve imagining a ball of light, or that you're enveloped by a very warm presence, which represents kindness and love for yourself. Then over the course of the meditation, slowly expanding this compassionate energy to encompass your family, your friends, your neighbors, your co-workers, your community, and then to the rest of humanity. While visualizing, you can repeat a chosen mantra, like, I deserve kindness, joy, peace, and security. And once you imagine positive energy is extended to everyone, imagine that this ball of light dissolves back into your heart center. Then follow with mindful reflection on the experience of practicing compassionate prayers and wishes for oneself and others. The hope is that by sending love and warmth to ourselves, we can release ourselves from the self-pity and self-criticism that we may feel during the grieving process. So to recap, I shared how we could apply understandings of impermanence and death as part of a life cycle towards cultivating an attitude of radical acceptance. Then I shared how a process-oriented view of grief could support awareness meditation practices in grief counseling. Lastly, I discussed the importance of developing self-compassion using meditation with imagery to reduce self-blame and self-pity. However, these Buddhist perspectives and approaches are not a panacea. There are a few things to keep in mind when considering the integration of Buddhist psychology into grief counseling. First, despite a plethora of scholarly research done on the psycho-emotional benefits of meditation, meditation is not effective for everyone. Some studies have reported that meditation may actually trigger depression, anxiety, confusion, or previously repressed emotions. For those with acute grief, perhaps suppressing some feelings initially rather than a completely open, non-judgmental acceptance of them all might be more appropriate. Otherwise, asking them to accept all feelings as they arise in meditation practice, it might actually run the risk of the bereaved losing emotional control and feeling completely overwhelmed. Clinicians need to meet the client where they're at and carefully assess whether the individual would benefit from a Buddhist approach and if radical acceptance would be appropriate. As a second caveat, for people whose belief systems are deeply rooted in Western value systems, so these are the ones that emphasize linear causality, independence, autonomy, and a strong sense of self. The Buddhist approach might require a radical shift in one's frame and reference. A resistance to Buddhist teachings might indicate that another, perhaps a more Western approach to grief counseling might be more appropriate. Otherwise, the clinician might risk frustrating the grieving individual with approaches that he or she is not receptive towards and increase negative feelings towards the grieving process. Lastly, despite the possible benefits of being process-oriented, this perspective or attitude towards dealing with grief might be too vague or ambiguous. It might not give a sense of resolution for people, especially if they're accustomed to viewing life as sort of a series of tasks or goals that need to be completed. The clinician should exercise caution when explaining a process-oriented model of grief and its experiences to the bereaved and carefully assess as well how receptive and open the person is to these potentially new ideas. I think it goes without saying that a good, good clinical skills are paramount to a meaningful and effective clinician and client therapeutic relationship, regardless of the specific interventions that are used. So as a future social worker, therapist, and clinician, I anticipate that Buddhist approaches to clinical interventions will become more prevalent. We're already witnessing the rise of mindfulness practices and cognitive therapy, pain management, addressing burnouts, and the list goes on. Given that palliative care and end-of-life care issues are becoming a priority in the media and politics, we can safely assume, or at least I will safely assume, that there will be a lot of research and work 
to improve clinical approaches of supporting those who are grieving and those who are bereaved. I hope this talk has helped you see the value in integrating Buddhist views of death and loss into grief counseling and forms of bereavement support. Thanks so much for listening. Experience with us, that's very valuable. So, any questions from the audience for Ms. Hong? I think there are people here who work uh, in the college of care. Yes. It's a heavy subject. Yes. Yeah. versus 
trying to understand the nature of existence and the world its impermanence like that really takes a lot longer. Um, and how can we like help people understand that? And gosh, that is such a good question because, like speaking just from my own experience, like understanding impermanence and and all of that, it's interesting that it actually required a significant loss in my life. So for my father to die, for me to actually confront it, like face to face. This is impermanence. This person that you think is going to live forever, you don't, of course, they want to live forever, but literally like, living forever in their minds is not living forever. They're gone. And, and it's really hard to understand impermanence without grounding it in a lived experience. And that's what I really strongly believe. And sometimes it takes longer for some people, and sometimes it doesn't take as long. But I don't think that's really the matter of it. Like, life is a process. It takes as long for certain people. Um, but I do feel like significant loss. And it doesn't have to be death. It could just be like a loss, like a loss of a job, loss of a partner, loss of something you really care about. So coming face to face with, gosh, things are not permanent. And then just, and really sitting with that. And I think if you're able to be with someone, so that fortunately I had a very skillful social worker who kind of, like she wasn't a Buddhist per se, but she really used a lot of those approaches that I felt were like understanding process and it's okay when things change and death is normal. And someone's skillful to sort of guide people through that process. But it's, I think, I truly feel like in understanding permanence, it's about guiding people towards a door, but they have to walk through that door. It's really a process. Now at this point, I wonder if we can invite the um, panelists to sit up in the front and we can have a, maybe a five minute panel before we go to the break. Well, let's give Ms. Ho a hand of applause. Okay, so any questions from the audience? It's a chance for you to maybe ask some cross-cutting questions that maybe more than one person can answer. Because you might see some common themes emerging as we're talking about the integration of Buddhist principles in, in here. So, so, any questions from the audience that some cross-cutting themes you've heard? The time to synthesize how the gist. Yes, I think I think this is going to be a cross-cutting um, echo with your presentation. Uh, speaking from the grief first, we think I think we have this preconception that grief only happens after death happens. Actually, grief happens way way before that. That was my own experience with my. Um, fellow nun who was actually dying last year. And uh, I think I went, I was going through grief because I was very mindful of my own feelings, of my own physical feelings, of, of my own mental feelings, of all the thought processes going through when I looked at her, when I saw her at her bed, uh, bedside, dying and everything. So when she actually passed, that grief actually did not overwhelm me too much. I was, I was still sad, of course. I mean, a fellow nun who has been with me for 23 years, we were, we were buddies. <laughs> then, you know, then I thought, hey, what happened? Am I very cold? Why didn't I have the grief that everybody had? <laughs> you know, and I did cry. You know, I had tears. I, I once said to my nuns, I, I'm very unhappy today. <clears throat> but after that, I actually started to examine myself. Oh, I started, I started going through this grief process way, way much earlier, about maybe four or five months earlier than the day when she passed away in December. So I think we have to have this uh, clear head to be very mindful, to be very self-observant of our physical well-being, of our mental well-being, in order to go through all the challenges in life, including grief. That is my sharing with, uh, with the panelists. Thank you. Okay, any responses from panelists about 
uh, looking at grief, and perhaps ask them, answer this question, if you die, do you want people to cry for you? <laughs> <laughs> yeah. <laughs> it, it, um, thank you for sharing that. It's okay for me to, to say something here. Um, Ruth Ozaki wrote a beautiful piece in, a, in, in somewhere in a magazine, and she quoted a poem called The Art of Letting Go. And, and it, again, it escapes me. Um, but uh, it's extremely uh, powerful in saying exactly what you said, which is that we practice grieving and letting go in every single moment. When I lose my car keys, when I you know, can't find um, something on my computer that I know I stored somewhere, or you know, a friendship dissolves, when children grow up and go away, um, that's bittersweet, but you, know, you still disagree. But we, we, we practice grief as an ongoing process, and when we can meet every one of these moments or learn how to meet them it, with equanimity, with compassion, uh, and with the eye of growth on transformation, um, it, it becomes more of, of um, our style of meeting things. It doesn't mean that it hurts any less, it doesn't mean that it isn't more challenging but we've got the practice behind us. My mother had dementia for 10 years, and um, that, those 10 years were an entire process of, of letting go. And I was telling somebody a story today that I, I would go and um, bring her clothes. She, she, she loved clothes, new clothing, and, and every, it was good because of dementia. She thought everything I brought was brand new. And so <laughs> I just had all of her clothes that she really loved, and I would take them over every so often. And I, I had gone on a Saturday and left her some clothing. And my mom and I had a very bad relationship. It was a very, very troubled relationship. And, uh, but when the time came to care for her, I seemed to be able to do it. I still don't know quite how I managed that. But so I showed up on Saturday with these new clothes from her old closet. And, uh, and she ripped into me as she normally did, you know, called me every name in the book and, and how it went on. And I took a deep breath and I said, I'll see you tomorrow. Sundays we would go to lunch. And so I showed up on Sunday and she looked at me and she smiled, this beaming, beaming smile. And she said, Oh, honey, I'm so glad you're here. She took my hand and she patted it. I'm so happy you're here. And I thought, Okay, like, is this a new phase of events here? Like, what is happening here? Maybe they upped her meds, maybe they downed her meds, I don't know. And, and she looked at me straight in the eye and she said, I just love you. You're not at all like my daughter. <laughs> and she watched it. And then she, she, you know, and I thought, there was this moment where I thought, this is awesome. <laughs> as soon as she forgot who I was, as soon as she lost that identity, I was able to let go and grieve my inadequate daughter identity. <laughs> And, and the, she lived three more years after that. It was the most amazing three years I've had. I ever had my mother. I had the mother I always wanted. We would go out to lunch. We'd sit out in the back of the nursing home. We, you know, I'd bring her chocolate. And, you know, it was it was phenomenal. So when she actually finally, when she finally did, you know, pass her physical form, um, I worried that maybe, you know, I, I this, this wasn't the traditional form of grieving. I was. A, crying and upset, and, you know, she was here one day, she wasn't the next, and it just continued on. Um, but I think that that was a huge transformation in terms of, of that whole process of having those 10 years of losing the identity over and over, finding new identities, new ways to connect. And, and I think for me, that's the brief process. When I let go of who I am, who I think I need to be, and, and you know, I'm open to what the next thing you tell me? Yeah. Uh, good comment. Uh, I had a story experience with you. My parents both uh, passed away within a year of each other after having mm -hmm. cancer. Mm -hmm. And they had a, a very difficult life last year of their lives. And so I went through a lot of grief as they were dying. When they finally did pass away, um, there was almost a relief in my part. So there wasn't a grief reaction at their death or before. But one remnant of that, which I think is sort of the, the gift of, of death, if you want to see that way, is that I now do. And since then, I look at everybody differently, especially people I know. For example, my daughter, my, my wife, I know they're, they, could, they will die. And I can see that 
right now that they're alive, or I could die, and they could be in the same position. But there's a sensitivity to that the um, uh, to life, and you know, and, and, and that process that we all go through. That the Buddha experiences when he left his his um, his kingdom and saw old age, disease, and death all around him. It, it should it should change you how you look at others, not in terms of being resentful or hating God or holding on neurotically, but more as you're as you're mentioning. Uh, an openness to the, the magic of life, know that it comes with goals and impermanence is it. Um, and that's it's enhanced relationships because it's hard to really hold negativity, aggression, um, resentments to people that you know may die at any time. You know? And, and it's, that, that can come just like that. So it should be transformative that way. And only death can teach you that. And Clara, did you want to add? Since you opened up the camera. <laughs> <laughs> Um, yeah, I love to echo what Tony and Lynette said, and um, I really do feel that confront the confrontation with that is a truly transformative experience, and echo what Tony said about that silver lining of death, and when the loss has occurred or is happening, um, you're grieving, and you realize that life is so beautiful in its presentness, and there are so many people who are alive who love you and that you do love and care for and that the world is beautiful in so many ways and it just it absolutely changes your perspective on life and I know for a fact that I became a zillion times more grateful maybe not as grateful as going through my teenage years but um, now it's it's so profound and I'm so grateful for that awareness every single day um, my mother is here and she is like everything to me and I cherish everything without her and it's because my father's not here and the same goes for my chosen family, my best friends um, and other people that I know and love and so it is a silver lining and that's how I choose to be resilient. So it's wonderful to hear about the use of uh, Buddhist concepts and understanding which can help the grief process. I also want to echo the common priest on the floor uh, and also what Clara has mentioned, we also have to go where, where the patients are at. Because as much as we know this understanding, sometimes the therapist can get into the trap of if you only understand the impermanence, but you're kind of beating the person over the head with this concept that right now is not fitting for that person. And so as therapists, we also need to be able to be cognizant of that and to be able to ourselves become even tolerant of someone's distress as much as we don't want to see distress out there. Right? So I think that's the challenge. And looking at conditions arising, I think now the conditions are heading towards a break. Do you feel that? <laughs> as I think people uh, have absorbed a lot, and perhaps we can have a break where the presenters are available for further questions, and maybe you can invite in some non-alcoholic beverage and go to some washroom break. And, We'll gather around at uh, 3 30. Maybe 3 35. Yeah, because we started a little later. Yeah, so maybe.